I'm going to admit something because I'm a confessor from way back. Um, even though I'm an English teacher and we are in the innovative place, I stopped at Atari when it comes to technology. I like to use my big board at school, but I don't think I've ever had a clicker, so this is going to be fun. Alrighty, so I am here because of story. And I am living proof right in front of you of the power that one conversation can have that can literally help to build a bridge that started in a small community in Eastern Kentucky and has went through the United States, has circled around the globe, and now finds me here speaking to you all. So in 2017, I was on a school bus because I was the academic team coach for the middle school, even though I'm a high school English teacher because you know you have to do those kind of things. When I was introduced to this program called Narrative Four from the opposing coach who also ran the Hyman Settlement School, his name was Brent Hutchinson. And he said, Mary, there's this program that's called Narrative Four. It's a global um, initiative and I think that you would love it. Would you like to learn more? Sure, ended up on a four-way phone call. And on that four-way phone call, I was introduced not only to Narrative Four itself, but its central pedagogy. And it's something that's really simple, but it changes the world because it changes a person. And it's called a story exchange. So what happens with Narrative Four is you get some people, typically no more than 10, in one exchange together. Each one of your all's tables will make a perfect story exchange, by the way. And what happens is you're presented with some uh, prompts and you get to choose a prompt, a story from your life that you want to tell. So you would be paired up with people you don't know, you would go to different places, you would share your story with one another, you would practice deep listening skills. And then when you come back to your larger group, you and your partner will tell one another stories but you will use the first person I. So if I'm telling Carl's story, I want to say, hi, my name is Carl, and I'm going to filter what he told me through my own experience and hopefully keep to the integrity of his story and share that. And he will say, hi, my name's Mary, and he'll do the same thing. And what you find is what most of you all have probably already suspected or experienced is that no matter where you're from, no matter who you are, we all share some pretty um, basic story experience. We've all been hurt, we've all had joy. But what ends up happening is just by embodying that other person's story for just a little while, the empathy that is built is unbelievable. So you're gonna see on the left, once I learned about this program, my students and I were paired up with a school in the South Bronx called University Heights High School. And so the left picture, this is the first time we've ever met, had no idea, we're all looking at each other in a screen, long before virtual was a thing. And it really wasn't until uh, Pizza by the Slice came up versus buying a whole pizza, which is a story for another day, that the students really just started talking to one another, which led to one of my students and I going to Limerick, Ireland for a global summit. And what was beautiful about that global summit is it started opening up the world. But when we came back, you'll see on the left, it also started my students talking to one another and sharing story in a way that they had not. In rural communities, some of y'all are going to know this, a lot of my students went to Head Start with one another and just moved on up the line. So you're graduating with people that you have literally seen your whole life. But what they ended up saying to me is, Miss Sloan, I thought I knew this person because I've seen them every day. But all of a sudden, because of the story exchange experience, there's a little bit more depth, a little bit more understanding. And once that started opening up in my classroom, you will see we started doing some one-on-one -on -one story exchanges with the students from the South Bronx. Well, I'm just gonna tell you right now, one of the things I love about Narrative Four, and this is what I love about this program, and I'm just now actually uh, getting to know a little bit more about it, is that it's a place of possibility, it's a place of what if. So next thing you know, notice it says welcome, because not only were we virtual, we decided that we were gonna make it happen, that we were gonna let our students from the South Bronx and from Southeastern Kentucky get together in each other's community. And one of the most amazing things happened is that my kids and I were going, okay, 
what do we have to offer? Turns out the South Bronx kids were saying the exact same thing. What do we have to offer? And because of that, we started looking at our own communities with the eyes of people who were visiting. And we actually had to cut things that we wanted to show. And you'll see how they were standing side by side. You'll see conversation. We did a lot of community world building, which I didn't know what that was called just now, but I'm feeling really good about the whole thing in retrospect. But notice the pictures after one week. This is one week of saying that let's enter into each other's space, not with a preconceived idea, but let's talk. Let's find story. Let's listen to one another. And so what we started doing is breaking down some stereotypes, really one story at a time, which led us going to the South Bronx. And in that experience, you will see, some of you all uh, have probably uh, read A Long Way Gone by Ishmael Bea, and he's on the left, and on the right is Colin McCann. So now my students are not only talking to other students, they're not only talking to one another, but now they're starting to branch out and talk to these people who have had these amazing experiences, who have these different perspectives from around the world, and they're engaging with them. And this also led uh, this experience with Narrative 4 to a school in Tampico, Mexico, where their fourth graders were making alabrijes. I never would have known what that was, I ain't gonna lie to you, had it not been for Narrative 4. So the, little, the kids from this fourth grade class are presenting to my students these alabrijes they've been working on. Unbeknownst to those kids, my students in creative writing, they make poems about those and send them back. So you have just this wonderful exchange of possibility and ideas and of culture that came one story at a time. Well, we started looking at our own school. We'd only been in, um, we'd only been birthed for two years. So how can we jumpstart culture? You jumpstart culture through story. And I love what somebody said earlier about this idea. You don't have people coming in telling you what you need. <laughs> let me tell you what your culture needs to know. But we let my students actually looked around. And if y'all have seen The Breakfast Club, you know exactly what I'm talking about. All the different cliques. And my kids watched um, the cafeteria. And they identified the different groups. They identified leaders in different groups. And by the way, on the day that we did this story exchange, I actually had to get one of them out of in-school suspension. But he was a leader in his group. Because we knew that if we could connect people who have influence, even inside of our building, that the likelihood of violence, the likelihood of demeaning behavior, the likelihood of bullying would be diminished. And not because adults are saying, don't do this, but because kids are saying, look, yeah, don't worry about them. Just, you don't have to uh, be mean. I mean, they're gonna say it a little bit more hip than that, but there ain't nothing hip about me. So I'm just gonna go ahead and I'll let you know. Well, which also led us to further in our, um, relationship with Narrative 4, and now we're going through the Northeast. And the kids are speaking, they are leading story exchanges, and this is pre-pandemic. And just so you all know, the kids from the Bronx were actually packing to leave to come to Eastern Kentucky when the world shut down. And so we, but we maintained that relationship. And also, during this time, we connected with one of our schools in, the, in South Africa who they were doing some protest uh, marches because of the deplorable educational conditions they were in. So my students did some solidarity walks. They walked, uh, I had students who gave up lunch every day to walk a mile so that they could make little videos and send to the kids who were walking saying, we see you. And uh, you know, I remember one of my students said in the video, uh, I gave up my lunch so that you could have one because that was one of the things that we take for granted that the kids were walking for. And just becoming aware, just becoming aware of the world around them, but also loving the world that, that you're in. I did not put these in the right order, so if you look to the left, heck, my students even did a food exchange. We did a recipe exchange. And I wanna tell you right now, the kids that we had with the, in the South Bronx, my babies from the South Bronx, eat plantains like nobody's business because there's a lot of different cultures where plantains um, that was just like the heart of recipes. My, my, ba my students went to three different counties to get every plantain they could because when we did story exchanges, it was all plantains. 
But we, they made a different, they made food for one another. And we, we ate together virtually. And we showed, because there's nothing like breaking bread with somebody so that you can really get to know. Because it wasn't just the food itself, it was the story that was behind it. And so we even have a little cookbook called Empathy Eats. And then you'll see here on the left, oh my gosh, I put a picture of me with my eyes closed. Didn't even notice that when I put that up there. But even during the midst of a pandemic, and this is the power of story, even when the world had shut down, Colin McCann had asked me if I would put together a learning module for his novel, A Paragon, that had come out in 2019, which is based on a true story um, of two fathers that live in Israel. One is a Palestinian Muslim, and one is a Jewish Israeli whose children, whose daughters were killed violently, but who decided that they were not going to let historical uh, divisions to uh, help them to perpetuate violence, that they were going to use the force of their grief for something better. And so I decided, well, heck fire, might as well go whole hog, I'm virtual. And so I did my whole year, I did a whole year's worth of lesson planning based on a paragon. And so my students actually got to meet, and you'll see uh, I, the one with the eyes closed is me, the one next to me is Rami, and then next to him is Bassam. And my students got to interact with them. So the Middle East became a place that was not politicized for them. It's a place where Abir and Smadar, one who, you know, girls that were there near their age who were killed, going out with their friends. And they have been able to come up with ideas. They've been able to talk. They've been able to even tell, tell the stories, actually. Um, and I probably run out of time. You gotta sing me down because I get really excited. So just sing me down. That's an Appalachian thing. You just get started anytime. But my students actually did story exchanges with one another. Half of them were Bassam and half were Rami. They actually had to uh, really delve into that, those, those men and then answer a prompt as if they were that father. And it was just a very beautiful thing, which led to uh, last spring. My students, we. Uh, got to, because I, I said we were owed. We were owed one more story exchange, and the Today Show decided to cover that. So you can actually Google the Today Show Narrative 4, and you will see what a story exchange looks like, and you'll be able to hear students actually to share stories. And really, it was this that got me started working with Emmy. I met Emmy. She was awesome when she was doing her presentation. And I was invited to uh, one of the claiming kinship activities because I love narrative. And I got to, wait a minute, you ready for this one? Oh, oh, no, this was when the kids were there. I even got to write my first blog of my experience with claiming kinship because it was so thrilling to see how story, see what story does, it may not tell us the what or the how, but story will always frame the why. And so when I got to do work uh, in the summer, working with people who taught science, and I had to choose low-hanging fruit, which was the water cycle, because I understood that sort of, I got to create, um, to model um, some station work that helps, that could help middle school teachers to say, okay, we're going to be studying, yeah, the water cycle, but let's, ex let's explore why. I'm not going to tell you why, but let's explore why, because that is the power of narrative. And I would just like to say in my closing remark that it truly is. I heard a, a preacher say that the kingdom of God moves at the power of relationship, but so does everything else in our life. So does change. It moves at the power, it moves at the pace of a single conversation. And I think that's what I'm most excited about being here, is hearing all of these opportunities, all of these stories, and how we're cross-pollinating. I mean, heck fire, you all know we keep hearing if you keep killing the bees that we're all going to die because they got to pollinate. But metaphorically, if we don't do that as human beings, then we see what happens, we perish. And so that's why I'm really excited to be here and to be true to who I am. And my students would really appreciate this. I want to thank you all, and I'm just going to, because that's my signature thing. I really appreciate it. Thank you.